Our goal is to symbolize something like this, all cats are evil. And as we saw a couple videos ago, we sort of ran into some problems because we didn't really know how to connect everything together. Uh, and we needed a robust syntax and meaning of the quantifiers. So we've definitely covered our syntax. Now we're gonna go over our quantifiers and start to symbolize. So how do I symbolize something that says everything tastes so good? Well, we really need to know the meaning of everything. And uh, this is sort of like an odd thing to say because when I say something like everything tastes so good, I'm talking about everything. Uh, so clearly something like this and something like that. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. But when I say every, it's really sort of uh, unclear whether or not I really mean every. You know, do I mean that these things taste so good as well? So what I'm highlighting is a problem in something called the universe of discourse. The universe of discourse really stipulates the meaning of what we mean when we say a word like every. It really says what are all the things that we're considering in our every claim. Now the thing is, the universe of discourse is often implicitly or contextually defined, right? So if I'm in a restaurant and I say everything tastes so good, I don't really mean that rock sitting outside the window. Uh, I mean what is sort of on our plate maybe or on the table. And so these sort of implicit and contextually defined things don't go over so well in a logic class like this. So we're going to actually have to sort of talk about what we mean by the universe of discourse uh, a bit more carefully. There are some other names for the universe of discourse. You can call it the domain, the domain of discourse, the, just the universe. Uh, it doesn't really matter. For us, we will talk about the universe, the universe of discourse a lot, and we'll just abbreviate it with UD uh, quite often in my slides. Okay, so what is the universe of discourse? Well, unless explicitly stated otherwise, our universe of discourse is actually just unrestricted, which means absolutely everything in the universe that is real, that exists, that we can name. So that includes, you know, my shirt, this desk, that camera, et cetera. But it also includes other things because we're sort of being pretty loose on what we mean by real. So the number four, sure, I'm fine with abstract things. What about colors, universals? Are those real? Well, those are like deep metaphysical, philosophical questions. Uh, we're not going to worry about that at all. We're just going to sort of treat these things as real that we can name them like seafoam green or something like that. What about ghosts? Uh, don't worry about it. Okay, these things aren't for this course. We're just going to assume that the universe of discourse is unrestricted and includes everything. Well, that's important because when we want to symbolize something like this, uh, for all x cx, we really need to know what this means. And remember that the universe of discourse is everything. It's unrestricted. So if I say for all x cx, where c means cute as the predicate for cute, that means everything, including things that we might not want to capture. If I want to symbolize all dogs are cute then, how do I do it? How do I actually make the claim? Well, here is one sort of reasonable way to link up the dog predicate and the cute predicate. I can say for all x, dx, and cx. But you have to ask yourself, what does this really mean? So for all x means everything, for all. But to be more precise, it means everything in our universe of discourse, which is unrestricted, so that's why it's everything uh, that we can sort of imagine or exists. But what we're then saying is that everything in our universe of discourse, everything in the universe, has the property of D and has the property of C. So that means everything in our universe of discourse is a dog and is cute. Now, surely that cannot be the right symbolization. You know, like this little PowerPoint clicker is not a dog, nor is it cute. So when I say for all X, DX, and CX, that cannot be the right symbolization. What we need to do is somehow we need to restrict the subject down so I'm not talking about everything in the universe of discourse. When I say all dogs are cute, really I'm not making a claim about everything. I'm making a claim about everything that is a dog. So here's another attempt at symbolizing this. For all x, dx, arrow, cx. So instead of using a conjunction, we're using the conditional to link my dog property with my cute property. And again, we have just have to ask, what does this mean? Well, because it's a conditional, it says, for everything in the universe of discourse, if that thing, which is the variable x, if that thing is a d, is a dog, then that thing is cute. So it says, if you're a dog, then you're cute for everything in the universe of discourse. So is this thing a dog? No. So this statement, for all x, dx, arrow, cx, doesn't apply to this clicker. And so it only applies to things that satisfy the antecedent, which is to say is a dog. 
And then it says, if you're a dog, then you must have this property of being cute. And that's how we symbolize all dogs are cute. This is really important and leads us to what I'm going to call the canonical form of a universally quantified sentence. And so a universal claim, when we say all this or all that, it may not be obvious to you at first, but these are actually sort of conditional claims. They're hypothetical claims. They say, if you satisfy this antecedent, then you have this thing in the consequent. And so the way we always want to symbolize universally quantified statements or sentences is that we have the universal and we pair it with a conditional, with the arrow. And in addition, the way to think about the antecedent is that's the subject, that's the thing we're talking about. And the way to think about the consequent is that's the predicate. So you can see that I have sort of this uh, levels of what this is really meaning. And I change subject predicate to the language group property. Now, why do I change it to group property? Well, it's just sometimes there's multiple subjects and the word predicate is, is, seems a little bit off. Um, technically speaking, subject predicate is perfectly fine. If you want to use subject predicate, go for it. Uh, I'll often use both, but group property seems to make a lot more sense to me personally, and also it makes a lot more sense to me later on when we do multiplace predicates. But it doesn't really matter. Nothing too, too much hinges on this. The idea if I want is, if I want to say all phi's are size, I start by saying for all and put a conditional down, and then the antecedent is the group or the subject, and then the consequent is the property or the predicate. And that's the way to symbolize universal claims. We're going to run through a very similar example for the existential. So how do I symbolize some cats are scary? There's my abbreviation scheme. Well, if I use the conditional canonical form, I end up with this. There exists an x, bx, arrow, fx. And again, I ask, what does this mean? Well, it's saying something weird. It's saying there is something, there is something in my universe of discourse, there is something such that if it's a cat, then it's scary. If it's a cat, then it's scary. But notice that that's not actually saying that there is a scary cat. It just says that it might have this property. So for all you know, I have this property. If I magically turned into a cat, then I would be scary, but I'm not magically turned into a cat. Now, you might think this is a ridiculous example, but that's actually the point. It's ridiculous because this doesn't really make sense. It doesn't capture what we want to mean when we say some cats are scary. I want to say there is a cat and it's scary. And so just in sort of phrasing it that way, we realize that this is wrong and this one must be correct. When I use the conjunction, the meaning of this is pretty clear. I say there is something in my universe of discourse that has the property of B, and has a property of F, and so it's a scary cat, or it's a cat and it's scary. And so this is how you symbolize existentials. Of course, this immediately leads to the canonical form of the existentially quantified sentence. And so unlike the universal, we pair the existential with the conjunction, with the and. And so you can still think of it in the same way. We will use the existential, and then we'll put the group, the subject, what we're talking about, so cats, and then we put the conjunction and we say the property of it. And the property in this case was, actually, I don't remember, evil, scary, something like that. So here, this is how we symbolize some phi is a psi, and this is the canonical form. And this is a go-to way of symbolizing. Okay, so what are canonical forms? Um, really, they're not strict rules or anything. These are recommendations. These are recommendations on how to symbolize when you come across a universal claim or an existential claim. And the reason why these are the recommendations is because they fit really with natural language. They fit with the natural meaning of our quantifiers and our connectives. Now, do you have to symbolize it in this way? Actually, no. You know from sentential logic that there's many, many different ways to create logical variants of a statement that are perfectly logically equivalent. So you could symbolize universally, universal statement entirely differently, and that would be okay. Um, but I wouldn't recommend it. I would just recommend sticking to this basic canonical form as it's a really nice, clean recommendation for how to think of a universal and an existential. And most importantly, it fits with meaning. So I keep talking about the quantifier meaning, but I haven't actually really like explicitly stated it or spelled it out for you. So let's take a look at what it means when I say something like for all x, fx. Well, we already know that this means that everything in the UD is an f. Everything in the universe of discourse is the property f, for whatever f predicate means. And if I go for all x, fx, arrow gx, it's the same idea. For everything in the universe of discourse, if it's an f, then it has the property g, and that's the canonical form. 
So I mentioned this already, but a really important word here is the word if. If sort of is motivating that we can really restrict the universe down into the group that we want to talk about and then bestow the property. Uh, but it sort of also tells you a little bit about the meaning of the quantifier. Before we go into the details of quantifier meaning, we need to understand what a substitution instance is. Now here's a sort of technical definition of a pretty straightforward concept. So here's a quantified sentence. A substitution instance of the sentence drops the main quantifier, and we replace the variables with a single individual, which is a name letter. And we can have the same definition for an existential. Now, this in practice is pretty straightforward. Here is my quantified formula for all x, f, x, arrow, g, x, and a substitution instance drops the quantifier and replaces all the variable letters with a single name letter. Remember that name letters are lowercase a through h. And I can do the exact same with any existential statement. Here's a nice existential formula, and I can create a substitution instance, a, a, and h, a. So a substitution instance isn't anything super fancy. It's just saying, hey, here's an example with this individual thing instead of a quantified variable. That's what it is. We can now get at quantifier meaning using the idea of a substitution instance, and I hope this is reasonably intuitive. Again, the technical definitions are one thing, but the actual sort of doing it is very straightforward. So here's the definition for a universal. If this universal statement is true, then it is true under every possible substitution instance relative to the universe of discourse. And for us, the universe of discourse is unrestricted, so that means everything. And for the existential, what does an existential mean? Well, an existential statement is true means that it is true in under at least one possible substitution instance relative to the universe of discourse. So that's what the quantifiers mean. The universal means it will hold under every substitution instance, and the existential means that it will hold under at least one, maybe more, maybe all, but at least one substitution will make the sta sta statement true. So all cats are evil. We know it's for all x, bx, arrow, fx. If I look at all the substitution instances out there, it just means I'm replacing every single uh, variable with every single possible name out there. And I'm going to put an and after every one. Why? Because the universal says all of these things will be true. And that's why I'm using the connective and, because this one is true, that one is true, that one is true, and so on. And so that's what is the meaning of the universal. Now, you might look at this and be like, wait, there's a problem. Look at this one right here. This one says, if Alex Koo is a cat, then Alex Koo is evil, but Alex Koo is not a cat. So there's something sort of weird about this. How can this be true? Well, it's actually not that difficult to figure out. You just need to remember that if the antecedent is false, what happens when the antecedent of a conditional is false? That conditional is actually true on its own. So there's nothing wrong here. The substitution instances all work because if you substitute something that's not a cat, you get a true statement. But if you substitute something that is a cat, well, then it must be evil, because all cats are evil, and then you also still get true statements. And that's why the universal just makes sense with a conditional statement. Uh, a universal is saying these all these conditions apply, and they apply for everything. That's what it means. For the existential, if I say some cats are evil, I do the exact same breakdown. I know it's there exists an x, bx, and fx, and I get this string. Except notice that it's not a bunch of conjunctions anymore. These are a bunch of disjunctions. Because what it means to say some cats are evil, it means at least one of these disjuncts is true. At least one thing in my universe, when I substitute it into the statement, it will be the case uh, that it satisfies this. So again, it's not a problem that Alex Koo is not a cat and makes this disjunction false, because we know that somewhere else, something is a cat and is evil. Well, I guess I'm pretending it's Frisky in this case. So Frisky is my evil cat. So that first disjunct is true, and everything makes sense. So this is a nice way of thinking what the quantifiers mean. The universal means that every single conditional will be true, so it's true under every substitution instance, and the existential means at least one. The key concepts in this video are pretty straightforward. You don't really have to worry too much about substitution instances or anything. You must know your canonical forms. So what's next? We're going to look at complex clauses and a lot of sophisticated symbolization, and we're going to use these canonical forms over and over again.